everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. Today, Sweeney Murdy tells his story. You know how a lot of kids grow up dreaming of being a professional athlete? Not me. I knew my athletic career peaked as a third-string safety on my high school football team, but many do dream of it. However, there are some who dream of talking about sports, and Sweeney is one of the lucky few who is paid to speak to professional athletes. He's had an amazing career that started over 30 years ago at the legendary New York all-sports station WFAN, and he's still covering the game as a senior contributor for Major League Baseball. So how did a kid from Philly end up covering the Yankees for 22 seasons? What did his family think about his career choice? And what's it like interviewing Derek Jeter? Let's find out. Hey, Sweeney, welcome. <laughs> How you doing, Joe? Nice to catch up with you here. Nice to catch up with you. And, you know, it's always good for, for professionals. The only way you can ever catch up is in a professional setting, so a podcast. So thank you for taking the time to join me today. Yeah, just a couple old radio guys doing what we do best, right? And that's what it's all about. And, and the funny thing is I want to talk to you about your love of baseball, and that's sort of what your day job and what you've been doing for most of your adult life. So I'm a first-generation baseball family. My parents were immigrants. My dad was a big soccer fan. So me and my brother growing up in New Jersey, we we started falling in love with baseball, watching it like on Channel 9 and Channel 11 uh, because they didn't have cable back then. So I, I drew the short end of the straw, sweetie. My brother chose the Yankees. And so me being the contrarian, I was like, well, if he's a Yankee fan, I'm going to be a Met fan. As you know, the Yankees have had a pretty good run uh, since the 80s. But I want to know how you fell in love with baseball. Are you a first-gen fan in your family? How did you fall in love with the game? Yeah, it so, somewhat first-generation. I'm first-generation born and raised here in the States. My parents uh, immigrated from India in the early 1960s. And the way my dad used to tell the story was that he came over here in the fall of 1961 to start a, a PhD program in economics uh, at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, he gets to class and it's early October, he hears the professor talking about the Yankees and the Reds in the World Series, the 1961 World Series. And he has no idea what they're talking about. But he kind of assumes that, that he better figure out what this is all about. So just through, really back then, through radio and through newspapers, uh, he would get the New York Times every day, read the New York Times every day, pretty much from you know when he arrived in 1961 until, until he passed. And he fell in love with baseball first that way as in uh, kind of like what you're talking about with your parents right come over here knows nothing about it and learns about baseball has some similarities to cricket which is very popular in india so like just from a from a physical standpoint uh my mother joins him over here a year later in 62 and she starts you know she's she's young and learning all about baseball as well so together they you know became phillies fans and they still talked about, you know, 1964, watching the Phillies collapse. And my <laughs> mom still has a vivid memory of seeing Jim Bunning uh, the, after he pitched his perfect game on Father's Day 1964, which happened to be in New York against the Mets. She vividly remembers him dressed in a suit and tie on the Ed Sullivan show a couple hours later on wow. that Sunday night. And just that image of seeing this guy who was wearing his baseball uniform and a suit and tie on Ed Sullivan sticks out to her. They became fans. I came along in 1970. We were in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area, uh, about two hours outside of Philadelphia, and still became Phillies fans. And in the 70s, as I was, you know, growing up and getting into sports, the Phillies were a powerhouse. They were the team that I first fell in love with. Earliest memories are probably 1977, 78. So those are my earliest memories of baseball. And then as you start to get old enough and learn how to read, you, you read books about baseball players, the newspaper box scores and start collecting baseball cards. I read somewhere and I hope, I, I wish I could find it to give the person credit, but I repeat it very often. Every baseball fan wants the game to be what it was like when they were 10 years old. And whether you're 15 now or 80 now, whatever the game was like when you were 10 is how you remember it most fondly and, at, and how you wish it would be. When I was 10, the Phillies won the World Series. It was the greatest feeling in the world. I still remember I still remember waking up on the Wednesday morning to go to school and thinking, oh my gosh, I get to go to school today and talk to all my friends about the Phillies winning the World <laughs> Series. That was my early childhood falling in love with baseball thing, which was an extension of like how my parents picked it up when they moved here from India. That's such a cool story. Thank you for sharing that. And it's so funny. So 
So my dad never got into baseball. And I don't know if you remember shortwave radios. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, I yeah. yeah, well, well, yeah. Yeah, I remember distinctly to this day. And I don't know if your parents did this for, for cricket, but like the only way he could keep in touch with soccer in, in Europe was yeah. listening to shortwave radio. And it was both basically, it was 90% static. I would rem- wake yeah. up yeah. Sunday morning, Saturday morning, and hear, and he'd make yeah. out the calls of soccer. So he never really got into so So my early experiences of going to ball games, I wasn't as lucky as you. We, we used to go to Cosmos games at Giant Stadium. So we used to, oh, you wow. know, once in a while, my dad would get tickets to, uh, you know, a baseball game and he would take us. But to, and he just did it for us because he didn't really get into baseball yeah, at all. We would go once a year, pretty much. It was, it was a fairly long, you know, back and forth. Yeah, uh, we'd go, we'd pick out one day a year and we'd go to a Phillies game. It was, it was very cool. But I have the same, you know, it's I, I love that you bring up the short wave because I started to think about radio and its place in my world growing up and how I gravitated towards it. And my dad listened to the radio all the time, and he had the short wave radio where he'd listen to BBC listen to the news and he'd try to pick up cricket scores and things like that uh, and all the news from overseas. But, you know, the idea of listening to a game on the radio, it was just always there. And I, I think it's kind of crazy and kind of funny that you have this same memory of your dad listening to a shortwave radio. And in the, like in the, to me, it was almost a subliminal message to me that <laughs> radio would be a would be a big part of my life. Like like I knew what listening to the radio meant and the habit of it and what it meant to people in their houses, in their yards, in their kitchens, wherever you're, you're going to be. I look back now and think that's where seeds were planted for my wanting to and and falling in love with being on the radio and talking about sports on the radio. And funnily enough. You ended up working at the iconic WFAN radio station in New York, probably the premier sports station in America, maybe the planet. And as a child, I was fortunate enough to be around when the fans started. I think it was, what year was the first year for the fans? 87. So I was in grammar school. And to me, this was like, this is crack for for a a kid to like have 24-hour sports that you can listen to, updates every 20 minutes. I remember because as a baseball nerd, the baseball trade deadline was always around like midnight, but it was always extended to like 3 a.m. because of the West Coast. Yeah. So as a little kid, I would fall asleep in my bed with the radio, listening to the fan, uh, listening to like Jody McDonald and Steve Summers talk about, you know, Frank Viola being traded to the Mets. And I'm like, it was the only way to find out. This is pre-internet, free social media. So fortunate for you, you ended up working at this radio. I ended up in a little little, little pop station in New York. I did okay. A little, the, like, 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 don't sell it short, okay? <laughs> Legendary <laughs> station working with, like, uh, working with a Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. Working with people who are legends in the business. You know, we we both got to we both got to sit on the sidelines of history at, at two giant radio stations, which I think was really cool. Absolutely. So let's talk about your jump into So I've, I've told sir before, I was a kid in college, didn't know how to get into radio. I think like you, didn't have any quote unquote connections. Uh, my parents didn't know anybody in radio or television. So I got, I started as an intern at WPLJ and then ended up spending the rest of my life there. But how did you get into the door at WFAN? Believe it or not, in Middletown, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, there is a radio station run by students. You could join radio club as early as seventh grade, which I did. And there was faculty advisors, but we were the ones we played music. We read news. We, uh, we did sports and we actually did play by play for the high school football and basketball games and older students, you know, kind of took that over and gradually brought in the younger ones. And I started doing that when I was seventh and eighth grade. So this little love affair that I have crafted between sports, baseball, especially, but sports in general as a kid and listening to the radio through our house, all of a sudden it all kind of came together. And I said, hmm, I kind of enjoy this. And then I said, wow, all these, you know, these Phillies games that I'm listening to on the radio, all these sports broadcasts that I'm watching on TV, those people have jobs. Those are real jobs announcing the games. It's all falling into place for me. So really, by the time I'm in eighth grade and ninth grade, I know exactly what I want to do. You know, much like an athlete who finds himself at that level of high school sports, finding out that you can compete at that level and that you enjoy it, I found the same thing in radio at that age. I finished up through high school and ended up going to Penn State, and I worked at a local radio station in town through a friend of mine who uh, had a connection there. 
uh, I got to work uh, basically as the assistant to the sports director. It sounds like I'm I'm, I'm like uh, Dwight Schrute in the office, right? I'm the assistant <laughs> to the regional manager. I was the assistant to the sports director. Got me a lot of behind the scenes and on air experience there as well. After my junior year in college, I was looking for internships, and you know, like you, you look for an internship in a radio station. I I didn't really know anything about WFAN. I'm talking about 1990 when I'm looking for an internship, right? I was intrigued by all sports, the Mets and all that broadcast, and I applied for an internship. I got the internship, okay? And everything good in my life like just changed after that. Like that's that's really where everything took off for me because the people I met, uh, the people, you know, Eric Spitz was the, I, I think he was an assistant program director or executive producer at the time uh, when he hired me as an intern. He went on to become program director, has since moved on to Sirius XM, has been an executive, has touched the lives of countless people in our business and sports uh, radio. He hired me as an intern. I got three months of an internship in the summer of 1991. You know, for a kid who's from a small town of Pennsylvania, I kind of looked at that internship and got through it and said, I think I can do this here. It was a good test, right? It was a good test to say, listen, again, I don't like to have too many parallels, but I do feel like there is some between the athletes who I watched play sports and the business that we're in, because you can make some of these jumps. And I got to a level that was the big leagues and I, and I realized that I could work there. I knew I was on the right path. I knew I was tr- uh, trying to do the right thing. I still had play by play aspirations on air aspirations, but about a year and a half after I graduated, I had been working part-time jobs in the Harrisburg area, diff- different three different radio jobs. Just take whatever hours you can get and do whatever jobs you, you can. Basically running the board, reading news, covering news stories, doing all kinds of different things. Almost a year after I graduated, about 18 months after my internship, Eric calls me back and says they have an opening on the overnight show with Steve Summers as, uh, as a producer and want to know if I'd be interested in applying for that. So... I did. And I took it. And it was not a lot of money. And I moved my life to New York. I was 22 years old and said, here I go. I was putting on air aspirations on hold at the time to take a behind the scenes job and say, let's see where this goes. And I think probably like a lot of kids who you know, move away from home for the first time, I wasn't really sure. Like I knew that I liked it and knew that I wanted to do it, but I wasn't really sure how it was going to work. A little nervous. I said, all right, let's just in my time clock. I said, let's give it two years. Let's do it. Let's, let's see where I am in two years. If this isn't working, I'll have two years at WFAN under my belt and maybe I can make something with that and go someplace else. I ended up 30 years later is, is where I ended up. At- <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It's so funny how similar our careers went because of internships. And I tell people to this day, and I know the internship mentality has changed where it's not free anymore. People are paying, which is actually great. So, but I say, get an internship as soon as possible. So I got my internship for some reason, I was smarter than I thought I was in college. I got I applied for interns when I was a sophomore. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, don't want to wait. I, I want to see if I want to do this for the rest of my life because I see a lot of folks go through four years of college and then get an internship in their last year. And they're like, oh, God, this really blows. I hate it. I, yeah. tell people, I give advice to people all the time now about internships. I said, don't just do one. Try different things. And like I said, this is like our industry. is like, It's like trying on clothes. Right, you have to see what fits, and you have to see what you like. And if you, I mean, so valuable. An internship could tell you and I that's exactly what we want to do, but yeah. it could tell somebody else, you know what? I don't want to do this at all, and send yeah. them in a different direction, and not waste time. So it's a very valuable lesson to learn. And also, I want to talk about the fact that you decided to make this a career. And I know just for, I have a lot of folks that have Indian immigrants, Indian families, and there is the cliche Indian parent of. They expect their child to follow their footsteps. You you mentioned your dad was an academic. What was that conversation like with your dad when you're like, hey, dad, I want to go into radio. I'm just, what was what, it the cliche that everyone expects from an Indian parent? Like, oh, no, you have to be an engineer. You have to be a doctor. What was that initial conversation like? For many other people, like extended family, it was. For my parents, it wasn't. And I'll tell you why. Uh, well, first of all, like, the academic part was 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 pushed. Okay, first of all, like going to college and uh, good grades and all that stuff, that's a must. After that, you know, you kind of choose where you go. But the field of study, it was a little bit of a conversation, but it wasn't outrageous because, as I told you, my father listened to the radio and he was a sports fan. He knew that those were jobs. As I said, like all of a sudden, the light bulb went off for me. Like, oh my gosh, that's a real job somebody has. Like. He understood that part. 
And I think the fact that I had been doing it, it, this wasn't a whim that I pursued and dropped on him at 17 as a senior in high school. I've got, you know, from seventh grade on, I am, I'm doing, I'm spending nights at the radio station and I'm, you know, we're doing high school basketball games and coming home late on a, on a Tuesday night or a Friday night after these games. And I'm spending weekends working at the radio station and like they're serious pursuits. I think there was some trepidation on my parents' part only because of an unknown for them of what, where the field goes, you know, there is a status and it's a cliche for a reason that immigrant families, especially from India, choose, you know, you'd be a doctor, you'd be an engineer, you know, at the time in the eighties, you know, computer science was big. Okay. You go into that. And because there is some sort of visual for them of here's the career path, here's the job titles, here's the money you're going to make, and here's where that goes. That's something that I noticed from extended family, um, that they had more questions than my parents did. Like they were more, why don't you want to be an engineer? Why aren't you, you know, and I I don't, I don't want to be like, this was it. And it was part of the freedom of, of being first generation born and raised here and kind of setting him. And my parents were, were progressive in that manner. Right. I, I'm thankful that they were, uh, but that's, it, it wasn't a difficult conversation. It was just one of, we're not really sure, but basically my, you know, and I don't, I never heard this strictly from my dad. My mom uh, tells me this where, where she, he basically said to her, let him try. That's really cool. That's great. Yeah, I always say that my, my parents were really cool about it. Always working class background. My parents, my mom was a Cuban refugee, came to the country with literally nothing. Um, and, but they were more focused on, I guess it was by osmosis, learning like work ethic and such. And they basically said to us as, as young children, like, we don't care what you do when you grow up as long as you're happy. Because they knew that no matter what we were going to do, we were just going to work our asses off. So whether it was working in radio or my brother working at, you know, uh, online companies, he works, he's now working in your, along in your, in your neck of the woods in Major League Baseball. So th- I think it was one of those things where the implied work ethic, they knew that no matter what we choose, as long as we were happy, that's all that mattered. And in a way, that's essentially what your folks were doing. Like they gave you your chance and then to see if that was going to bring you joy. And I think that's one thing that as parents, if you're a parent listening today and you don't know what your kid wants to do, just like, just set them up, like set them up to succeed. Give them all the tools that they need to make their decisions. Yeah. And, and like the college life and the college experience was something that was, it was deemed, it was a hundred percent necessary. And regardless of what I was doing, this is where you were, you, what you were going to do, you're going to go to college and then we'll figure it out after that. That's right. And uh, you fast forward to the fact that you ended up 30 years at WFAN, which is a pretty good run. And during that yada, time- Yada, 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 that part too. Yeah, yada, 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 the 30 years. That's all, that was a huge yada, yada. Um, a big chunk of that was you being the beat reporter for the New York Yankees. Now, obviously being a, a Phillies fan, you didn't have any of that homerism to worry about. You you were, you were had a job to do. Um, so what was it like covering a team like the New York Yankees? You being a, a baseball historian, you knew the importance of the Yankees and being in a town that was, unfortunately, as a Met fan knows, it's it's a Yankee town. What was that responsibility like to be in charge of the beat of the New York Yankees? I think I was fortunate that, you know, I got to spend eight years working at FAN before that and understanding, you know, not that I knew the history of the game, but then understanding the day-to-day of what it sounds like on our radio station and what the fans were feeling and what they reacted to and and, you know, what were the kind of things that, were important to them to hear working in different roles at the radio station and hearing that I think was, was a very valuable experience for me before jumping into that. I don't think I would have been ready to handle it or done it the right way. If I had been handed that job at, at 23, 24 would not have happened. So I, I was almost 31 when I got the job uh, covering the Yankees. So it, it felt like just kind of like, this is what I've been working up towards because I told you like play by play was my, was my dream, but I tell people now who, who do the same thing. It's like, here's the problem. Okay. Like the people that I wanted to be when I was 13 and 14 years old, when I graduated college, they still hold those jobs. Like they, you know, those jobs, the job I wanted wasn't open. The people who I grew up listening to still had them. When I was 30, those people still had those jobs. They're, they're good jobs and they're fun jobs and the people who get them don't give them up. So Yes, great goal to sit there and say, I want to be play by play for the Yankees or for, you know, the the Knicks or whatever. But the the people who have those jobs, 
don't tend not to give them up. So you kind of have to shift, you know, your path at some point, figure out what's what. So that's kind of what I ended up doing. I was a producer at WFAN and then an update anchor at WFAN. And then this job of Radio B reporter, which Susan Waldman had held from, you know, from 1987 when the station started up until through the 2000 season, I was starting the 2001 season as she transitioned over uh, to a different role. That was a new job altogether. I think for the idea of people who are saying, I want to do this. Well, this job was available to me. It's not on this path. It's on this path somewhere or may, this one, wherever you're, you know, just a different track. If you're thinking, of, thinking about it in terms of like trains and subways or whatever, it was available. It was a job covering baseball. It was a job talking about baseball on the radio. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm glad that our radio station was really the only place that could, that existed. And it did turn up in other places, but not to the same full-time level that it did at our place early on. And Susan really just created that and made it into what it was, and I was able to just jump in and try to fill her shoes. That's, again, something that I'm thankful for the experience of what WFAN was and what it allowed me to do. It took me a little while to get into the flow of what I was actually doing and to gain the credibility that I needed to have because, and here's where Mike and the Mad Dog were really good to me, and other people in the radio station too, but Mike and the Mad Dog didn't need to put me on the radio to tell them about the Yankees. But they did because they knew that it was good for the radio station and it was good for me. You know, the radio station is paying me to go cover the Yankees, right? So you got to put them on in prime time once in a while to pay that off. But they knew that it was important to me and establishing me in my career to put me on once in a while. And they asked me questions that they probably already knew the answers to. And just let me kind of do my thing and, and and talk and learn. And and we battled sometimes, right? That's when I knew that I was getting better at this because they would start to challenge me on things and I would fight back with them. And we'd have a little on-air battle about it. And, and, and it was fun. And I, I, I remember one time specifically where we just kind of yelled back and forth at each other. And I called them I called them individually. It was right before they went off the air at 6 o'clock. So, and I called them both after I said, do we make good radio today? Like, like ed- more so for my own head, making sure that it wasn't personal, that we were all cool. But it was just this idea, like they led credibility to me by letting me come on and establish that I was covering the Yankees every day and that I knew what I was talking about. If these guys who know everything and are very discriminatory about who they're putting on their show if they're allowing this guy to come on and talk about the Yankees with any sort of authority, then maybe he knows a little about what he's doing. And as much as I kind of struggled to just kind of in my own head, make sure that I, you know, I knew what I was doing, that I knew what I was talking about. They helped establish that for me because of what their show was. Other people on the radio station, I think the same thing, but I think Mike and Chris could have gotten away with never having me on, right? Because they knew they could have gotten bigger name people than me. And they could have just talked about the Yankees themselves with a great deal of authority. Uh, they put me on and helped me establish my credibility. That's awesome. It's it's so great to hear that. And you know, I had I was fortunate enough to work for a couple of guys that gave me an opportunity too at a very young age. And, and they, these guys don't have to do that. Uh, but I think I think a lot of it too is, and this could just be me psychoanalyzing them now, is the fact that they, you know, whether it's the folks I work with, Scott and Todd, or, or Mike and Chris with you, like they saw a little bit of themselves in you, and they could relate at a certain level like oh okay this this guy's cool that i could fight with this guy and, and he's not yeah, yeah, worried right. about hurting feelings or anything like that yes not taking it personally that it was a job right and that like part of like there is an entertainment value to what we do obviously and if you're gonna jab back and, uh, and understand that you can take that and understand that there is there that there is something to that and um you know it, it and it doesn't always have to be about yelling at everybody you know it's just about trying to figure out the entertainment value and understanding where you can kind of push and pull and poke and prod. <laughs> yeah. And you took over the Yankee gig at a pretty weird time because it was essentially right at the end of their dynasty. And then they yeah. ended up w- winning a World Series. So they, they, I mean, they were always good, the Yankees. Their Yankees are always good. No matter, even when they're bad, they're good. Um, Correct. So out of curiosity, during those years of, of covering them on, on the beat, and you're still basically doing the same thing now, but give me like, in terms of enjoyable players to cover, who, who are a couple that come to mind when people say like, who's a great, and I don't even care if like they're like good players or not, but like who was just fun to chat with before or after game or just shoot the shit about random things. 
when I first started is 2001, as you said, the Yankees are winning all these championships and they're full of star players. I was kind of into the idea that I can't just walk in and, and try to be their best friend from the be- very beginning. Like, like let's, let's play the long game here. And because I had that in my mind, I was also like recognizing that there's 25 players in this room. If my job is to kind of figure out what's happening around the Yankees and everybody's kind of focusing on the, you know, five or six stars. So there's 20 other players here who can, who I can talk to coaches, things like that. So I made sure I talked to all of them. The backup catchers on the team were always people I used to love talking to. Um, My first year, it was Joe Oliver and Todd Green. uh, And then it was, you know, Todd Green, who I still uh, talk to uh, very often. And John Flaherty was a backup catcher for three years, who's still one of my good friends. Like I draw a distinction. Like I was at the Thurman Munson Awards Dinner in New York and I saw Tino Martinez was being honored. And I had a couple of moments where I got to chat with Tino and smile and laugh and but I remember covering him specifically. He was a very intense player. And when you're thinking about the hours leading up to a game or the immediate few minutes after a game, the intensity these players have when you're interviewing them formally is different than what you have when you see them away from the field. And when they get when they get further away from the actual competition, the years they're competing. So I see players now who I, like and Tino's a good example, who I get along with fine when I covered them as a player, but there's just so much a different level of that intensity is gone because they're not competing anymore, you know? But the idea that, you know, we're kind of in there doing the same kinds of things, like, like, like I'm competing on a different level, right? Like I'm, I'm reporting and working alongside people who are work for the New York Post or for ESPN, people like that. I think in some level they understand that uh, that I'm competing too, just in a different field. I, I like to think that I I didn't push the players too much unnecessarily, and that I that I knew when to when to ask them tough questions, when to back off. Uh, and the the thing I realize is that these guys watch you do your job. Okay, like they know like. You don't know this, but they're watching as they watch how you do your job and whether they listen to WFAN or people, their wives, brothers, cousins, whoever, friends listen to WFAN, they'll find out what you say about them. As all of that comes back, they get a picture of who you are, what you're saying, how you do your job. And as that happens, that's how you build a level of respect with these guys. That's so cool. Now, uh, we all have someone in our life where we have to talk to, but we dread talking to. Was there anyone during your course of your, your Yankees, whether it was like a player or, or manager or coach, that you, when something went wrong, you're like, oh, geez, I don't want to talk to them about this situation, but I have to because it's my job. Did you? Ha- was there ever a player like that where you were, not that they were bad or anything, but you just knew that that interaction was just not going to be fun? All the controversies that followed A-Rod were hard to deal with because it wasn't stuff that we wanted to talk about kind of stuff you had to talk about. And sometimes it was, it it was difficult just because of, you know, all the situations he put himself in Jason Giambi with, with that PED stuff, when that story was floating around, Jason was such a likable guy. We all, we all liked him dealing with him. And then having to kind of poke him about this was, was difficult to do. Randy Johnson, when he first came over, had, had a couple of different things that was just, it was just hard to go talk to him about certain things. But then other times, you know, you could sit there and you'd have a 15 minute conversation with him. You go, well, Alex was different sometimes because there was like once or twice a year, I had these really cool baseball conversations with him. And I'd be like, why isn't that guy here all the time? Why do I get him twice and get the other stuff, you know, all the rest of the year? I, th- I think those are the things that sometimes, and those are just, you know, top of my head, those are big stars because you have to talk to the big stars a lot. You know, they're the ones who, you know, who draw the attention. But again, I, I like to think most times the way people saw how I did my job, I had a, just a way about me of, of conversing with them that it wasn't too difficult. Sometimes the difficult conversations you had, and then you just moved on. Awesome. That's great. All right. So let's, let's wrap this up on your favorite Derek Jeter story. I'm going to share you mine. Um, so a few years ago, I knew someone who who had a, a I don't know, I'll say relative who played in the Yankees organization and was invited to St. Petersburg, his his palace down in <laughs> Florida. And so he went with a group of of, of other uh, baseball players, walks to the door, 
and at the in the front door is a basket and everyone's like looking around like what's this so it's like a pretty big basket and so he goes Derek says welcome and he goes put your phones in there all yep. the players it was as if they were going to like some sort of like security checkpoint for the military all the players had to place their phones in the basket before they could enter St. Petersburg uh, which I love that story which is like it just goes to show you like yeah I want I, wa I want to welcome in these young guys but I also want my privacy. So it's, it's yeah. to me, I always, that encapsulates who Derek Jeter was as a pro and, and as, as a public figure. It's like, listen, I'll give you a little bit of me, but I get to choose what, what I give out. So what is your favorite like Jeter story or interaction that you have? In spring training, this time of year, I would have, you know, college basketball, right? Was the was thing. And Derek was a Michigan fan. I'm a Penn State guy. This is, I don't know if this is my favorite. It's just kind of what popped up to me when, when you said, probably because it's time of year. Michigan wins a big game one year in like the conference tournament or something. Or maybe it was first round NCAAs. And he walks in that morning in spring training. He walks in wearing this bright yellow Michigan t-shirt, right? And I'm standing over by, there's a bulletin board that has like the, the lineup card and the workout schedule and things that they're there for the players, but they're also there for media to kind of see and study and say, okay, at nine o'clock we need to be over here because that's where the infielders are taking practice or whatever. I'm standing there. The morning after this big Michigan win, Jeter walks by me, you know, wearing this Michigan shirt. He walks by me once, walks by me twice, walks by me three times. You know, like everybody, you, you, you kind of like, you go to your locker and you change your uniform. He hasn't done that yet. He's walked by me like two, three times. Like, okay, I get it. I get it. Congratulations. Big win last night. He, he was just egging me on because he, you know. Because this, this is. So that's, he was that waiting was, for you to say something to him because he, he was, was like parading him. himself. He had a grin. He had a grin on his face as he walked past me with his shirt on. He knew that I was seeing it, that I wasn't saying anything yet. So it was he was egging me on. It was fun to talk trash with him a little bit, right? But he was he sent out a nice tweet at me when I posted news uh, last year that I was leaving WFAN. He actually posted a tweet about, "Hey, congratulations! It was nice working with you. Can't see you know wait to see what's next." Blah blah blah. Um, I, I I I got along with him pretty well. Um, you know, I'd never been to St. Petersburg. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't text them regularly. I'm not one of the, you know, it's not one of those things. When we see each other, uh, we get along. We get along. I, I covered him fairly, I thought, and well, and he was great to watch. It was fun to watch. And I, one of the, my favorite thing, one of my favorite things of, of all the time was watching guys like him and Mariano, not just perform as great as they did, but watch them prepare to be great players, the work that went into it. And those are the things that I, I kind of, take away after all the time and they said i got i got along with him pretty well i think and uh as, as well as a reporter was allowed to be yeah. i think i think there was a distance that uh had to be kept for, for all of us that was just kind of the fun thing that kind of popped in my head as you were talking that's cool and, and put a pin on that i'm just out of curiosity how does the interaction go when the person doesn't want to speak because there are times that obviously that happens especially during the course of a 162 game season is it usually just like Hey, can I have a minute? And they'll say no, and then you just walk away. Is it because I almost feel like it, to me it reminds me of like a guy at a bar, like where you tr you're trying to find like all the hottest girls, and you're walking up, and then what, you're like, "Hey, can I borrow your drink?" And they say no. Like, is it as quick as that? You don't really get a no a lot. So, so I mean, I guess sometimes you, depending on the story, like if it's a negative story, and you go up to, and they're like, they're like, "I'm not going to say anything about that right now," or like, you know, you know, I don't want to talk about that right now, or I'll talk to you guys later, and they push it off, or they push it off, but. A lot of times for, for people who are there every day on the beat, there tends to be like an understanding, like the players see you and they understand, they understand that the, there is a requirement to give you some sort of time, right? They can't just always just say, no, I don't want to talk to you. Uh, but it's a matter of, hey, is this a good time? Or, hey, I really need to talk to you. Can I, can I get five minutes from you? They'll say, uh, can you wait till this time? Can you wait till I go take batting practice? And can you catch me after BP? Um there's a general understanding of like, we have a job and part of it is talking to them and it's just a requirement and they have to carve out the time and we're respectful of, if he says, Hey, I can't do it right now. I can be respectful of that. Cause I know I'll still be there or he'll come back to me later. Um, I had, I had something like with judge, uh, like two years ago where it was getting towards the end of that season. And I just really needed 10 minutes with him and I hadn't really bothered him a lot in that short period of time. And, and I think he kind of sensed that I hadn't asked him a lot. I gave him the impression that it was important that I talked to him. So after batting practice, 
we sit up in the dugout and I just, you know, I got 10 minutes with him in the dugout. And I said, thank you. That's all I need. And, and he was good with it. It's never really a, no, I'm not going to talk to you. At least from my experience, it was more like, when's a good time? But certain times when there's a big story, it's just like, yeah, you know what? I got nothing to say about that. And that's basically when you read somewhere, so-and-so had no comment. That's what that probably that's how no that comment. Went. Got it. Yeah. Well, it's been an awesome chat, Sweeney. Th thank you so much for sharing these stories. And I feel like, you know, our careers are kind of similar-ish that we just kind of, we followed our passions and we spent a long time in, in businesses that generally people don't last that long. So uh, kudos to you on that and surviving and then, you know, pivoting to television. I mean, you're just doing such a great job. And I'm sure there's little Sweeney Murdies across the country right now watching you, listening to you on a daily basis. But I want that guy's job. And then they're going to be like you 20 years from now. Like, God damn, that Sweeney Murdy does not want to leave that this job. When is he ever going to work? Here. Yeah, they can have my old job now. I guess, you know, I, I gave that one up finally. So uh, so they can have that one. But listen, honestly, same to you. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm i a radio rat too and just listened all the time. And, you know, I was I was telling my daughter the other day, a song came on the radio. I said, you know, I remember walking around Astoria where we were in at WFN with a Walkman on listening to this song on WPLJ. Yeah. And, you know. And she's like, was, what's the Walkman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, she knew what it was. She had looked it up oh, somewhere. Okay. Or something probably. Yeah, I mean, we, I think we crossed paths and knew each other's names and like where we worked and we're fans of each other's radio stations. So cool to do this with you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, sweetie. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. You too, Joe. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to reach out, feel free to shoot me an email at joepartavilla at protonmail.com and tell me your story. Lastly, it'd be awesome if you could leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and hit subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.